السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. بسم الله والحمد لله صلى الله وسلم وبارك على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد. Last week we ended on some ahadith that relate to qira'a, recitation, and we spoke about reciting the best manner, the author. We said this is one of the few chapters in which the author presents his actual opinion, which is Ba'u Tarki al Jahri, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, chapter on not saying Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim loudly. And we mentioned the hadith of Anas quoting the Prophet وسلم, and Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman. The author then moves on to Ba'u Sujood al Sahih. Sujood al Sahih. Sahih means to be absent minded, to forget, okay, to for something to pass you without you noticing. It's an unintentional mistake. And as you guys know, the sunnah of the prayer is that if there is a significant mistake in the prayer, a significant mistake in the prayer, it's recommended to perform sujood as self. Now, not all mistakes require sujood as self. I'm going to explain that, you know, the position here according to Imam Ahmed, because there's a lot of debate and discussion on whether sujood as is wajib in the beginning or not, when is it wajib, and so on. And the position of Imam Ahmed ta'ala, is that sujood as is wajib if it relates to a mistake that impacts something that is wajib. So, if you miss something wajib, so the sahul becomes wajib, for example. Like if you miss the first tashahud accidentally. We'll see the hadith of Ibn Mas'ud in a minute. And it is not required to make sujood as sahul if you make a mistake that doesn't relate to obligations. For example, there are some things that are strongly recommended in Salah, but they're not technically obligatory. Can someone give examples of things that are so strongly recommended that many people probably think they're wajib, but in reality they're not wajib? Huh. Good reciting a surah after al-Fatiha is a strongly recommended sunnah, but it doesn't invalidate the prayer. Yeah, good. Saying Subhanahu wa Taala, Subhanahu wa Taala, three times is not wajib. Okay, is it wajib to say it once at least? That's the view of Imam Ahmad. You have to say it once at least. Now, also, what about yeah, raising the hands, for example? Uh, you know, is, is certainly not wajib, including the first raising of the hands in takbirat al-haram. Most people know that raising your hands from rukur and standing from rukur is not wajib. Most people know. That. Okay, but from the beginning, that's also not considered an obligation. Now, another important example is unintentionally reciting loudly or unintentionally reciting quietly. That also doesn't invalidate the prayer. But would you call it a mistake? Let's say now, we prayed Maghrib. Let's say I recited the Fatiha quietly. Allahu Akbar. I mean, and then I realized. I realized I recited it quietly. Do I need to repeat the Fatiha? I don't have to repeat it because I've recited the Fatiha as an Imam. Is that a mistake though? It's still a mistake. It's still a mistake because I left out something that is an important Sunnah. It's a well established Sunnah. And so, making sujood the sahul in this case is recommended, but it's not obligatory. Sujood the sahul in that case is recommended, but not compulsory. Okay, let's have a look at two important hadith the author mentions, and then we'll see how do we reconcile between these two hadith. The first is he says, "An Muhammad ibn Sirin, an Abi Huraira." Of course, Muhammad ibn Sirin is what a Sahabi or a Tabi'i. He's a Tabi'i. 
So technically there's no need for mentioning Muhammad ibn Sirin here because the author consistently just mentions the Sahabi and the Hadith. But he's a muhaddith, okay, he's a specialist in hadith, and sometimes the muhaddithin like to mention Asanid. Could be for different reasons, okay, and sometimes it's just because it's a famous Isnad or something. Muhammad ibn Sirin was one of the greatest ulama of Basra. There were three major ulama of Basra in, around in that time, in his time. The first was Al Hassan al Basri, who's the most famous of them. The second is Muhammad ibn Sirin. And the third is Qatada in the Amas Sadus. All three of them were major ulama. But Al Hassan al Basri was the most famous of them because he was not just a faqih and a mufti, but he was a preacher as well. And he gave reminders and heart softeners, and people were impacted by, by his teaching. Muhammad ibn Siri was your faqih, your mufti, alim, muhaddith. And Qatada was one of the most precise of the muhaddithi. Basra, by the way, in Iraq, produced some incredible ulama. And even in the generation after this one, some incredible ulama were produced. Ayyub al and Yunus ibn Ubaid, and also uh, Abdullah ibn Aum, and other ulama, incredible ulama of, of their time. Anyway, Muhammad ibn Siri narrates from Abu Huraira. The Prophet that he said, رضي الله عنه, صلى بنا رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إحدى صلاتي العشاء. Okay, the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم led us in prayer. Either ظهر or عصر. Okay, one of the afternoon prayers. Ibn Sirin says, Abu Huraira mentioned which prayer it was, but I don't remember it. Yeah. He says, فصلى بنا ركعتين ثم سلم. He prayed two rakahs. And then, Salaam alaykum wa rahmatullah, Salaam alaykum wa So he's missed out two rakahs. By the way, this statement by Ibn Sirin, Abu Huraira mentioned which prayer it was, but I don't remember, shows the precision of the muhaddithin and the narrators. But something that's, that's, this is not significant, is it? Zuhur al it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that much. Because the ruling is still going to be applicable. Especially Dhuhr and Asr because they're so similar. Uh, but they were precise in the narration. فَقَامَ إِلَىٰ خَشَبَةٍ مَعْرُوضَةٍ فِي الْمَسْجِدِ Then he went up to, you know, a plank of wood that was inside the masjid. And he was clearly agitated and uncomfortable. He said, وَشَبَّكَ بَيْنَ أَصَابِعِ And he did this with his hand. Locked his fingers together. And this narration supports the view that doing this in the masjid is permissible. Because there is a hadith that you might think, oh, so what? It's not, it's not a big deal. But it is a, it's important in this case because there is a hadith narrated prohibiting interlocking the fingers inside the masjid. But there are question marks about the authenticity of that hadith. And this hadith, we don't have question marks about its authenticity. So we're going to give it precedence over that hadith which is, which is not so strong. You know, some ulama mentioned that the Prophet ﷺ didn't like khilaf, opposition, or it could be because of distraction, okay, or it could be because of not doing so. This is, doing this is disliked in salah. Doing so is disliked in salah. But that's only really because of not standing properly and, and some kind of distraction. Anyway, so the Prophet ﷺ was clearly agi agitated and people started to walk out. And people are starting to talk as well, saying, has the, has the salah been reduced or what? Why did he only pray two rakahs? وَفِي الْقَوْمِ أَبُوْ بَكْرٍ وَعُمَرٍ And Abu Bakr and Umar are there. They're present. They're praying with the messenger. فَهَابَ أَنْ يُكَلِّمَا But they were... Uh, too, you know, embarrassed or shy to speak to the messenger about it. And this shows that how many prayers do you think Abu Bakr and Umar prayed with the messenger up until now? Many. Because Abu Hurairah only accepted Islam later on. 
So Abu Bakr and Umar have been praying so many prayers with the Messenger. They know Dhuhr and Asr are four rakats. It's easy for them to say, you know, you, you made a mistake. But this shows that if there is a leader or someone who is more senior in knowledge and so on, it's important to not rush to speak and to not rush to correcting what you think is a mistake. And once Abdullah ibn Abbas was teaching a class, so somebody kept telling him salah, it's salah time. Salat, he kept repeating. He basically made dua against him, saying, you know, La you know, making dua against his mother, really. Okay. Uh, but that wasn't something that they intended literally. It was something that kind of rolled rolled off the tongue. He said, Are you, are you teaching me salah? And there's a, there's a time to say Jazakallah khair And there's a time to teach a lesson on other And Abbas wasn't responding like that out of arrogance yeah, Who are you? Don't talk to me You know, like that It wasn't that kind of attitude But it was Don't rush into speaking in front of people who are more senior than you I know Salah I prayed with the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Many prayers so Abu Bakr and Umar kind of shied away and, and didn't speak. Does that mean that's always what you should do? Always stay silent? No. Because somebody did speak. Yeah? And that's what's mentioned next. It says, There's one guy with long arms. Okay. In Algeria, people want to give you a nickname, they put Abu in front of it. Abu Dhra, Abu Kirsh, Abu Ratz, Abu, you know, like that. Okay. So, uh, you know, this, this was the same. Dhulia Dain is almost like the guy with arms. Yeah, guy with arms. So, this man said, Ya Rasulullah, Qasrat is Salah al Masid. Has the Salah become shorter or have you forgotten? And the Messenger didn't criticize him for speaking. Why did you speak? The reason the Sahaba in particular were cautious though is because they know revelation comes at any time. Allah can reveal <coughs> something for today and abrogate it and so on. Anyway, so the Prophet said, I didn't forget, and the Salah hasn't been shorter. It's still four rakats. Then he saw confirmation and said, Is he telling the truth? And that shows that calling someone by their nickname if it's not an offensive one and they're okay with it, it's okay. But nicknames that are offensive innately or most likely people are offended by aren't permitted to be used. Allah Ta'ala says, وَلَا تَنَبَزُوا بِالْأَلْقَابِ Don't call each other by nicknames, offensive nicknames. Uh, even if someone says, no, it's okay, I'm, I'm okay with it. If you sense that likely they are disrespected, they feel disrespected or they feel hurt by it, it is sinful. It is sinful to use nicknames against people like that. But there are times when, when, when it's okay and acceptable, like in, in this case. So anyway, when people confirmed and said, yes, we prayed two rakahs only, he went forward, prayed two rakahs, thumma salam, then he made salam. Then he said, Allahu Akbar, after the salam, and made sujood. Then he sat back up and made sujood again, two sajjads of sahu. And then, thumma salam, then he made salam. There is no mention in any of the sound hadith, there's no mention of repeating the tashahud. Okay? There's no mention of repeating the tashahud for sujood as However, the madhab of Imam Ahmad is that if you are making sujood after salam, so tashahud, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, Allahu Akbar, like in this hadith, 
he prefers doing tashahud again. And that's because Imam Ahmad views that every salam should be preceded by tashahud. So if this salam is independent from the prayer, separate from the prayer, there should be a tashahud before. That's the view of Imam Ahmad, and other ulama disagree. And like I said, the hadith don't really specifically mention tashahud, which is why fuqaha have, have differed on that issue. Oh, I don't recall the view of Malik, to be honest. Yeah. You look, look that up and, and tell us, let us know next week, inshallah. Um, he says, yeah, so that was, that was that. So now, what happened, what was the mistake? He missed two rakahs. By the time he added the two rakahs, did he add to the prayer or subtract from the prayer? He's added to the prayer. What did he add? He added the taslim, he added extra takbir. Yeah. So that's an addition to the prayer. In the following hadith, it says an Abdullah ibn Buhayna, I said Ibn Mas'ud earlier. That's a different hadith. It's Abdullah ibn Buhayna. Another companion. He says the Prophet وسلم, prayed dhuhr once and stood up after two rakahs. So this is not giving salam early, this is standing up after two rakahs without doing the first tashahud. ولم يجلس. He didn't sit down. فقام الناس معه. So people stood up with him. You don't sit down quickly do tashahud. Okay. Allahu Akbar. تحياته. Then you realize the Imam stood up. Let's say you start. Allahu Akbar. تحياته. Allah Salawat. And you realize the Imam's up. Don't finish your tashahud. I'll finish mine and then stand up. The Imam was made to be followed. Stand up. Straight away. Because people are followers of the Imam. There's only one circumstance when you don't follow the Imam, and we'll mention that in a second. He says, when he finished the prayer, people waited for him to make salam. So he's done his tashahud, of course. Yeah? قَالَ كَبَّرَ وَهُوَ جَالِسِ He said, Allahu Akbar As he's seated فَسَجْدَ سَجْدَتَيْنِ ثُمَّ سَلَمْ Yeah, two sajjahs of sahu and then salam. So this sajjah of sahu was before the salam or after it? Before it. So one hadith, it's before, one hadith, it's after. And we have a few other hadith as well. How do we combine between these? We mentioned this before. And that is that Imam Ahmed's view is that you always do the, tash- the t- sujood al-sahu before the salam. He says because that's the more common practice of the Prophet Except in this case, the first case. He says where the Prophet is made sujood al-sahu after the salam, you do it after the salam. Every other sahu is before the salam. That's Ahmed's view. As for Imam Malik, and Ishaq ibn Rahawih, and a group of the Muhaddithin, their opinion is that if you are adding to the prayer, your sujood al-sahu should be after the salam. If you're subtracting from the prayer, your sujood al-sahu should be before the salam. Now, there's two things to say here. The first is the reason Malik holds this, holds this opinion. Firstly, is because he views this to be the practice of the ulama of the tabi'in in Medina. Secondly, the Prophet ﷺ sometimes did it before, sometimes did it after, and we consistently notice a pattern. And that pattern is that he added, he would do the salam before. If he subtracted, he would do the salam. Sorry, I keep saying salam. Every time I said salam, I meant, I meant seven. So do the salam. So if he adds to the prayer, so the Sahu is going to be why? He's already added. By doing the Sujud al-Sahu before the Tasleem, he's going to be adding more. Does that make sense or not? Yeah? Imagine you prayed five rakahs, Dhuhr. If you added or subtracted, <coughs> added. If you do Sujud al-Sahu before you've even done Tasleem, you've now added another thing to the prayer. You've added a rakah and you've added two Sajdas. That's a problem. So in that case, because you've added, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, then, Surah al 
If you've subtracted, such as you missed the first Tashahud, or something along those lines, you missed the second Surah, you missed something along those lines, in that case, you should do the Sujud Sabal, and then, Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullah, just as the Prophet Sallallahu did in that second Hadith. So that view is a view of Malik, and the fatwa of many ulama is, is on that position. Allah What's the one circumstance in which you don't follow the Imam? Yeah, or if he is adding a pillar of Salah that's going to invalidate the prayer. Okay, so now, the Imam, for example, says, Allah Akbar makes wuku. And Samia Allah Ali Then he says, Allah Akbar goes back into wuku. You don't follow the Imam in that. Because following the Imam would be an intentional addition and an intentionally, intentionally adding a pillar to the prayer which would invalidate the prayer. Or if you've prayed four rakahs and the Imam stands up for a fifth, you stay seated until the Imam sits back down. Because intentionally adding to the prayer invalidates the prayer. And you know this is an addition to the prayer. The Imam's prayer is valid because he's unintentionally adding. But I would be intentionally adding to the prayer. That's the view of the Hanabi. There is a second opinion, however, and you know, the Fatwa of Sheikh ibn Baz was on this. And that is that you follow the Imam regardless, even if he adds a rak'ah, even if you know something along those lines. His view is that the Imam could have missed something that you don't know. He may have missed reading Fatiha in the second rak'ah, for example. Okay? So he may be adding another rak'ah because of that. Okay? That's, the, that's, you know, that's, that's his fatwa. And the view of the Hanabila is that you don't follow the Imam because this isn't. That scenario is unlikely. It's unlikely that he's adding a rak'ah because of that. And more likely is that he's making a mistake. So you don't want to be intentionally adding to the prayer. And that happened in this masjid, not too long ago, maybe some of you were here, and it caused a bit of a, you know, confusion. One of our sheikhs says, I walked in, and I saw everyone stood up, except Zahid sat down. He said, you were the only one who sat down behind the Imam, and everyone else stood up. I said, I went by what I know. This is the, this is the view that we know. You know, you don't follow the Imam because, because of, uh, it being an intentional addition. And that's also the view of the Shafi'is. So I said to Sheikh Muhammad Saidi, who's a Shafi'i, I said, why did you stand up? I thought you were, you're going to stay seated with me. At least somebody would be. So he said, well, he, I was supposed to sit, stay seated, but I wasn't sure. When I saw everyone stood up, I, I started to doubt myself. And so I just stood up. <laughs> so anyway, that's the view of most fuqaha, is that you don't follow an imam on intentional additions. You stay seated. If the Imam continues, let him continue. Don't do salam, well, let him continue. Till he sits back down, does a tashahud, you do tashahud. Salam alaykum, salam. Yeah. Yeah, so you, you, you're traveling and you get to the masjid and you, you intend to do two rakah um, first, yeah. but the Imam is actually doing four rakah of Isha. You intend you to do what, sorry? So you're intending to do Maghrib, but the Imam is doing Isha. Yeah. Are you allowed to stay seated on, at the fourth rakah? No, in this case, this is a different scenario. We, we discussed it before. And that goes back to the issue of intention being different from the intention of the Imam. Yeah, and we said that most ulama don't allow that. So in that case, you would uh, pray Maghrib yourself and then join the, the Jama'ah for Isha if you wanted to. That's the view of most fuqaha. But if it happens in the past, if it happened in the past, you prayed Maghrib and the Imam is praying Isha and you try to work around it somehow and that's okay unless you prayed four with the Imam okay and intended Maghrib and said I mean four is more than three and I intended Maghrib so it should be okay then no that Salah is not valid to begin with because you're intentionally praying four rakahs for Maghrib that Salah is not valid you'd have to repeat that okay but let's say someone did what you said they stayed seated waited for the Imam Salah is valid but it's not something you want to do again because, you know, we discussed at length why not. Uh, 
uh, in, a, in a previous lesson. Allah, if you had something? Yeah. Sometimes when the Imam makes a mistake, say on the second one he does something with the shahu. He mm. say it for a couple. And he gets up and people stay sitting and say, Subhanallah. Yeah. And then the Imam just sits down after. Fine, that's okay. If he sits down immediately, okay. You've stayed seated in Tashahu and the Imam sits down straight away, that's okay. If you've said SubhanAllah and the Imam's not listening, okay. Or he says, too late now, I've stood up. Then that's fine. Salah is valid and everyone else has to stand up, even if they haven't finished Tashahu. Yeah. You know, while you're doing any prayer, right? And, uh... After Surah Fatiha, uh, you recite something and then you, by mistake, due to similarity or by mistake, you join another two surahs together. Yeah. Means you made a mistake. You didn't finish yeah. one surah and you then you started another one. Went into another surah, yeah. So, and is it Sajjah Sahu Wajib then? No. No, because mistake in, mistakes in recitation or missing an ayah, forgetting an ayah, none of that requires Surah to say. Who was it? 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 If the Imam stands up for a fifth rakah, yeah. you stay seated. Yeah. No, no, that's the first tashahud. First tashahud, you stand up because sitting for the first tashahud is not a fall, it's not a pillar of salah. Yeah, and also you're not adding anything to the prayer. Whereas that case is adding intentionally to the prayer, so it would be a problem. طيب. Final scenario before we move on. If you go into the masjid intending to pray two rakahs because you're a traveler and the imam's praying four rakahs, yeah? If you start the prayer with the imam, then you have to pray four rakahs. You have to, it's wajib to pray four rakahs. You can't end the prayer before the imam. Yeah? This hadith is a principle for so many scenarios. If you join in the second rakah, how many rakahs are you going to pray with the Imam now? Three. Can you pray the whole of three? Can you say, I mean, I only have to pray two and I pray three, that's an extra one, so my salah is complete? No. Because Dhuhr and Asr is either two or four, there's no other option. <coughs> so if you join in the second rakah, you have to complete a fourth rakah, even if you're a traveler. If you join in the third rakah, that's where. Most ulama still say you have to pray for because you're behind an imam and therefore your prayer is connected to his prayer. If he's praying for, you pray for. That's the view of the Hanabi. And Ishaq ibn Rahawi's view, and it's a very interesting opinion, Ishaq's opinion is that if you join in the third rak'ah, you can finish your prayer with the imam. Why? Because you followed the imam from beginning to end, from the beginning of your prayer, obviously till end, you ended your salah with the imam, you didn't end before him, you didn't oppose him, and you prayed the two rak'ahs that you've been commanded to pray. That's the position of some of our mashayikh as well today. Um, it's a minority view, uh, you know, but it's a, it's a reasonable opinion, Allah Yeah. So how far down the Nah. Ta'da'ima tukhlijna al Yeah, adi, adi. مثلا انا هنا يا شيخ زهد نعم انت ممكن بامكانك تقدر تمر من هنا نعم لكن هو سيذكر الحديث المتعلق بالستره بعد بعد هذا الباب هو يسال عن اذا انت تصلي كان يو ووك اهيد اوف 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 ذا مصلى باختصار نعم يختلف معك يقول لك يا اخي انت ليش يا اخي انا بيني وبينك اكثر من مترين سبحان الله yeah, he, he's right. We're going to come to that issue in a second. Okay, the, uh, if there is a reasonable gap between you and someone praying, can you walk, walk ahead of them? We'll, we'll have a look at this hadith shortly. Yet in hadith, inshallah. Yeah.
Um, say I joined, say you know, at some periods of like in the, in the year, mm. they join Maghrib and Isha Salah. Yeah. So say I go to the mosque and I intend to pray Maghrib, and I don't know if they're praying Maghrib or Isha because I came a little bit late. Mm. And I join, and I miss one rakah and I pray, to, and the Imam does three more rakahs, so and he prayed Isha. Does that count as me praying Maghrib, or is yeah. that Salah valid or what? If it's happened in the past, it's valid. However, uh, like I said, the issue of difference of intention, especially on a prayer that's different in, externally different, three rakahs and four rakahs, um, you try to find a way to know what the Imam is praying and, and uh, you know, if you're that late, okay, that means that you can see are they sitting after the third rakah, first rakah of reciting quietly, are they sitting and so on. Try and know what's happening, and then you either decide to pray alone or, or to join the Jama'ah. Yeah, Allah. Yeah. Yeah, good. The author, uh, if I'm not mistaken, might mention the hadith of Mas'ud later in the comprehensive chapter of Salah. But if someone doubts themselves in Salah, then the Prophet told us to take with certainty and then do sujood the Yeah? Take with certainty and then do sujood the cell. What's certainty? Certainty means the minimum. Yeah? The minimum that you're sure of. You know it's definitely the third or fourth rakah. Can't be the fifth, obviously. And you know it's not the second. So you assume it's the third. Because that's your, your minimum. You don't need to start the prayer again. But you assume always the minimum. He should go with what he's certain of. After the prayer, then you do sujood as And if we're going to go with the method of adding or subtracting, you're going to end up doing sujood as when? Huh? Before or after the salam? After the salam, because you're doubting, and there's a, there's a likelihood that you've added. And if you haven't actually added, then you've added, there's a uh, you know, distraction of doubt. Yeah, so that madhab it's that. Ahmed, we mentioned his view. Yeah, final question? said that about six times now, but yeah, go on. <laughs> okay, so, in, so in the scenario that you're explaining about the uh, Imam doing four of um, Dhuhr and the traveler joining, that yes. is the last, so imagine he joins in the last Raka'ah. Yeah, 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 same, same thing. So if he joins the last Raka'ah, according to the majority, he has to pray four. Majority. And whose madhab did we mention is along with it? It's Haqim al Who, by the way, if I say it's Haqim al that's like saying Imam Ahmed. This guy is a giant giant in Ilm. He is no less than Ahmad Shafi'i and these other great ulama. So the reason I mention him a lot, number one, is because him and Ahmad were very close friends. And his madhab and Ahmad's madhab are basically one madhab, one methodology. And that's why at Tirmidhi, when he quotes Imam Ahmad in his book, he always quotes Ahmad and Ishaq together. Always. And al Kosaj one of the students of Imam Ahmad and one of the students of Ishaq uh, compiled the fatawa of Ahmad and Ishaq and they're printed now in like 12 volumes what he would do, he used to ask Imam Ahmad then he'd go to Ishaq and say, Ahmad says this, what do you say? most of the time Ishaq says, Kama qal. same thing that's my view as well and sometimes he goes against Ahmad and says no like on the issue of when do you do sujood al sahu Ishaq says, I agree, but you add, when you add, you do sujood sahu after, when you subtract, you do sujood sahu before. So, uh, Ishaq, you know, basically has his own madhab, but it's a part of the madhab of, of Imam Ahmed. His view is that if you joined in the last rak'ah, you just need one more, because you haven't, haven't done anything that's problematic in this case. Yeah. Allah. Tayyib, he says, Babu al-Mururi bayni Walking ahead of the Musalli. Abu Walid had the Babuk. He says, I have been to him, 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 If the one walking in front of the Musalli, the one praying, knows the gravity of what they've done okay knows the gravity of what they've done this wording in front of you says 
من الإثم the gravity of her sin we'll come to this word in a second he would recognize that it's better to stand there for 40 than to walk in front of the Musab okay Abu Nadr, one of the narrators says I don't know whether he meant 40 days or 40 months or 40 years and it doesn't really matter even 40 minutes because the point of the hadith is to say it is better for you to wait even if you wait for a whole hour or more than for you to walk in front of the musalli firstly key word this is the importance of the Arabic language because sometimes translation doesn't always capture the meaning he says bayna yaday al-musalli what does the word bayna yaday mean? literally between your arms between your hands but in the Arabic language it means in front of you, in your space yeah let's say there's a gap between me and the end of the masjid no one's in front of us no sutra, no person, nothing and someone walks ahead would you say they've walked in front of me? not in front of me, they walked in front of me they walked, okay we're in line but that doesn't mean they walked بين يدي and this is why uh, you know, fuqaha slightly differ on what exactly is the distance a person can walk ahead even if there is no sutra, nothing to cover that person from praying one view is literally just the place of sujood and that's one opinion in the Hanbali school because the place of sujood is, is your prayer space yeah, it's your prayer space anything ahead of you is no longer your space also Someone walking right in front of you is a distraction. Someone walking a meter, you know, a meter, two, three, four meters ahead of you is, is no, shouldn't be a distraction. Okay. That's supported by the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ in which he said, if, one, if someone tries to walk in front of you when you're praying, فليدفعه. He should put his arm up to push them away. فَإِنْ أَبَى فَلْيُقَاتِلُهُ Sounds like a, a strong word. If he refuses, then you should fight him, literally. That's, that's, the, you know, that's the wording used in the hadith. But what's meant by فَلْيُقَاتِلُهُ is to insist on stopping them. Once Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, someone tried to walk ahead in front of him. So he put his arm. So this young man, tried to look around to find another spot to go through he couldn't, so he tried to walk in front of him again so Abu Sa'id gave him a, a proper one a proper hair, nice firm forearm so he went and complained to the Amir and said this is what he said to me well, this is what he did to me so Abu Sa'id said, I heard the Prophet Sallallahu say this hadith that I just mentioned if someone walks ahead of you, put your, you know, block them and if they uh, if they insist then, then it, you insist as well. فَإِنَّمَا هُوَ shaytan, Because that's a shaytan. I.e. It's, it's the action of the shaytan. Because the shaytan is there to distract us from prayer, isn't it? And so by this person doing this, they're, they're doing the role of the shaytan. No. <laughs> he says we need... <laughs> He didn't say kill him, he said, you know, push. Anyway, what he'd say, we need, a, we need an official distance for the masjid where people can, can pass in front. Like we said, so we don't need to specify distance because when we specify and attribute it to the sharia, then we're, you know, claiming that this is, this is from the deen. It's like we're saying Allah has set this distance. No, we're not saying that. But we're saying the word بَيْنَ يَدَيْ الْمُصَلِّي generally implies there is some kind of gap. If there is a reasonable gap, you can walk ahead and that's okay. In the middle of the Hanabila, it's three arms lengths. So you're talking about 1.5 meters. That's the mashur of the Hanbali school. Yeah? Uh, and like I said, the fatwa of a lot of the mashayikh is place of sujood. Your furthest spot of sujood, okay, because a person making sujood might Make sujood on this spot now, second sajda, might be a bit further ahead, isn't that right? You're not going to hit the same spot every single time. 
So your furthest point of sujood, that, you know, that distance is a place where someone shouldn't walk in front. After that, yeah, that's okay. If there's like two of these, for example, that's enough space. Yeah, there's no harm of people walking, walking past. Yeah. Some people don't even pass the yeah, so that's, that's the first mistake, which is that there should be some kind of sutra, because the Prophet is going to mention a sutra uh, in the following hadith. Yeah. Is there an exception to this rule at the Haramain? Uh, there is some discussion on uh, is there an exception in the Haramain or not. Al Bukhari, rahimahullah, is very clear in his sahih that there's no exception. Yeah, because he says that hadith, or, hadith you know, Prophet is. However, the fatwa of many ulama is that there is an exception in the Haramain. Why? Because sometimes it can be so packed that okay, you wait for one person, by the time you've passed them, there's another person there. By the time you've passed and you wait for them to finish their prayer, there's another person. There's no going left, there's no going right, there's no going forward, there's no going back. And so, 40 years. Uh, exactly, you're there for 40 years, so you've, you've missed Arafah and your Hajj is over. <laughs> That's another example of something which is uh, difficult to control. Yeah, exactly. yeah, difficult to control. Yeah. 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 So it's not something that needs, uh, you know, too much uh, causing difficulty on people because circumstance is an exception to the rule. It's an exception. Uh, you know, no other place is, is like it. Allah. Yeah. It's also worth Yes, exactly, yeah. So this is what, yeah, you reminded me. So this is what I started saying and I didn't finish saying. And that is this hadith of stopping someone supports the view that if they're walking further ahead of you, then what are you going to do? Step forward and chase after them? No. So, it means that if they are within your, within your reach, within your prayer space, like we said, anything beyond that. Now, this is a really interesting word, just from an extra fact, it is not that essential. But the word ithm, ma'ala alayhi min al-ithm, is not found in Bukhari or Muslim or Abu Dawud or Tirmidhi or Bimajah or Sunan al-Nasari. It's not found in any of the major compilations of hadith. Interestingly, Ibn Hajar, rahimahullah ta'ala, pointed this out. He pointed out that this word, al-ithm, sin, isn't mentioned in the main books. Then in Burugh al-Maram, he went and mentioned the word Ithm in his, in, his own, uh, in his own book. Either because different copies of Burugh al-Maram could be, it could be because he, he forgot. However, it doesn't really matter that much. Because, ماذا عليه, what's upon him, means what? Means accountability, right? So the word sin, whether it's there or not, the meaning is going to end up the same. This is another example of the muhaddithin being unbelievably precise on wording, even if really the meaning doesn't change that much. So what then on important wording, there's no doubt that they, you know, they preserve that. This is the hadith that I mentioned, hadith Abu Sa'id al-Khudri. I heard the Prophet وسلم, saying, okay, if someone's praying and uh, someone walks ahead of them, you know, in between them, then they should uh, block them. Um, one of the benefits of reading the different narrations of hadith is that some narrations will mention a background story to the hadith. Like I mentioned the background story to this hadith, didn't I? Yeah. Abu Sa'id, how he acted upon it himself. Yeah. And uh, sometimes in these concise books you don't get that. And the background story to a hadith is very helpful in providing context. Because it shows how the Sahaba acted upon it. It shows us that this is not abrogated. It shows us, you know, lots of different things. And Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu anna wa qala akbaltu raqib ibn al-Himal ibn Atan. He says, I came into the masjid on a donkey. And I had just come close to puberty hitting the age of puberty. And the Prophet ﷺ is praying with people, leading people in prayer in Mina. Ila ghayri jida. Okay? And there is no, there's no wall between him and 
uh, you know, the place that he's standing in front of him. And this supports the view that praying with a sutra is a recommended sunnah, but it's not wajib. That's the view of the former there. That praying in front of something, praying to something, is recommended, but it's not wajib. Okay? What also supports that view is that the Sahaba radiallahu anhu prayed in the masjid. Yeah? They prayed in the masjid. And it's not narrated that every single one of them had a private, personal sutra or something that they used to pray in front of. Yes, many of them used to pray behind the pillars. Yeah? They used to pray behind the pillars. So that's absolutely fine if that option is available. Um, but if there's no sutra available and you know something, then there's no harm in someone praying, praying anywhere. If they come forward or pray behind a person, you know something along those lines, that's okay. It doesn't invalidate the prayer anyway, but it's a strongly recommended thing. So anyway, he says, I walked into the masjid on a donkey. Or I walked into the prayer space where they're praying, because it's in Mina. <coughs> he says, فَنَزَلْتُ So I came down and I left. I left the donkey to, you know, to go, and then I entered into one of the rows, and no one criticized me for it. Yeah, this hadith shows that there is no harm in walking between the rows, because the sutra of the imam is a sutra for everyone behind him. So in taraweeh and things like that, or in jama'ah, there's no harm if someone's walking in between the rows, uh, for whatever reason. The final hadith in this uh, subheading, is a hadith of Aisha. She says, I was asleep, I would be asleep in front of the Prophet. Again, Baina Yaday. Baina Yaday. Right in front of the Messenger. She says, And my feet are facing him. Yeah? Are they further ahead, her feet, or are they in his prayer space? In the prayer space. Because she says, فَإِذَا سَجَدَ غَمَزَنِي If he wants to make sujood, he pokes me. She says, and I move my legs, I tuck them in. وَإِذَا قَامَ بَصَدْتُهُمَ When he stands back up again, I stretch my legs out again. She says, وَالْبُيُوتُ يَوْمَ إِذِنْ لَيْسَ فِيهَا مَصَابِيحِ And the homes at that time didn't have lighting, candles and other lighting. And it shows how small the house was too. Yeah, it's a small place. Yeah, and, and so this hadith is interesting because for, for many different reasons um, but it sh shows that obviously someone uh, being there in front of someone praying is not a problem. It also shows that some kind of movement in the salah for benefit is okay, like moving someone out of the way, tapping them, that type of thing, we've mentioned this before. And Aisha radiallahu anha heard some people saying the Prophet sallallahu said يَقْتَعُ الصَّلَاةِ Three things cut the prayer يقطع, cut, that's the literal translation <coughs> Three things cut the prayer الْمَرَأَةُ وَالْحِمَارُ وَالْكَلْبُ الْأَسْوَةِ A woman and a donkey and a black dog So Aisha when she heard that said بِئْسَ مَا شَبَّهْتُمُونَ بِالْكِلَابِ وَالْحَمِيدِ so what in the world is it comparing us to dogs and donkeys? And then, after she said this, she mentioned this hadith. This is another example of context. She said, I used to sit in front of the Prophet wasallam whilst he's praying, and if he makes sujood, he would tap me for me to move my legs, and if he stands up again. Now the issue is that the hadith on this issue are actually authentic, and they're narrated by a number of companions. And... It could be argued, in opposition to Aisha radiallahu anha, that uh, there is a difference between walking ahead and between being sat, you know, just sitting there. Um, and this sometimes happens, doesn't it? Somebody's praying in the second row. Iqam has been made. And there's a gap in front of that person on the second row. Are we visualizing? Yeah? There's a gap in front of that person. No one wants to fill the gap because 
They don't want to step in front of someone praying. But in reality, standing in front of someone praying is not passing in front of them. There's a difference between passing in front and between stepping and standing in front of them. And so therefore there's no harm if someone moved sideways, even if someone behind them was praying in order to fill the gaps and complete the rows before the Salah starts. Anyway, even then, most ulama believe that the Prophet ﷺ only mentioned these things as major distractions to the prayer. They don't believe that they actually invalidate the prayer. We saw the example of Ibn Abbas and the donkey, and the example of Aisha, okay, and uh, the hadith of dogs walking in and out of the masjid is mentioned in Sahih al-Bukhari as well by Abdullah ibn Umar. Anyway, there's plenty, you know, a lot of debate we don't need to get into now on, on that issue. Finally, well not really finally, but um, the author then mentions Babun Jan, in which he mentions a collection of different hadith on different topics related to Salah. They don't necessarily come under one chapter, but they're different hadith related to different issues and so on. Any comments before we mention one or two hadith and we end with that on this chapter? By the way, um, talking about Ibn Abbas and just reaching the age of puberty, this Sunday at Al-Hikmah, uh, I'll be uh, delivering a course called the Fiqh of Growing Up here at Hikmah for boys aged 11 to 15. And first thing is to let you know, okay, for those of you who uh, want to attend, some of you, or who have relatives who you want to send, we'll cover things like puberty and tahara and uh, growing up and maturity and uh, gender interaction and different things that that, that age group uh, needs. The second reason I mention that is because I would appreciate if there could be, you know, one or two or so volunteers on that day. Um, because this will be a program that runs from 12 to about 5.30 to Asr. From 12 noon to about 5.30. And Asr, no, it's what time here? It's 5.30, yeah, so we'll end exactly at Asr. And uh, there's going to be lecturing and PowerPoint slides, but there's also going to be some uh, discussions, uh, you know, group discussions and so on. So it'll be good if some of the, you know, older uh, brothers, by older I mean older than this age group, above 15. Uh, some of you, especially locals, if you're around that time, speak to me afterwards. That way we can, that will be helpful. Tayyip, uh, back to any comments on what we've covered so far before Bab al -Jan. Right. The author, rahimahullah ta'ala. If it's slight movement, it's okay. Yeah. If it's slight movement, it's okay, but there's no need to uh, be too uh, sort of insistent on, on there being a sutra. Because, you know, like we said, especially if there is enough space in the masjid, there is generally a sutra. Yeah, there is generally a sutra for people. In other words, people already have space to, to move around. Um, but if there's a, you know, one or two steps or there's something closer by, there's no harm in moving slightly. And there's also no harm if someone puts a sutra in front of you whilst you're praying, it's okay. It's not far off to do that, but it's okay. Yeah. Is there anything on the size of the sutra? Uh, in Sahih Muslim, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned مِثْلُ مُؤَخِرَةَ الرَّحَلِ or مُؤَخِرَةَ الرَّحَلِ And that's the, you know, the seat that used to be placed on, on animals, donkey or horse or something. The seat that's placed on it. Uh, the back part of that seat which you lean on that should be the size of the sutra yeah which is approx approximately one arm's length so again we can say about 45 centimeters something like that that's a recommended you know kind of thing um, but really any any kind of um, any kind of size is okay well i mean that's that's definitely not the size that mentioned in that hadith but it would suffice as a sutra if there's, if there's nothing there because the point of a sutra is that there is a gap between you and, and people walking by that's it and that's why uh, Imam Ahmed narrates that and there's debate on its authenticity if someone can't find a sutra then they should at least draw a line on the floor 
Okay, so the, the whole point is that there is a kind of space. That's it. How does the apple work in the other side? Because if you go, let's say someone runs there, or close to me, if I go down, I'm going down into the pot. Sorry? If I'm going down, and you're picking up my sword to put in front of me, I'm going down into the pot. No, no, I'm saying that if, you're, if you've started your prayer, then there's no need to insist on moving around to find a sutra.